this winter. I would like to welcome all the members of the Worshipful Company of Farmers, and in particular, the Lady Mayoress, Hilary Russell, and our new master, Richard Whitlock. I would also like to welcome the applicants for the next management course who are joining us today. I know many of you have attended our Learning Extension Days, which we hold at Cranfield University. And whilst we're not able to hold the Learning Extension Day this year due to the COVID-19, the WCFA committee wanted to replicate that experience by means of a series of topical, thought-provoking, and above all, interactive webinars for WCFA members, friends of the association, and our commercial partners. I would like to acknowledge the continued support of Roy Thorne's solicitors who are sponsoring this first webinar and welcome Julie Robinson, the Head of Agriculture, who is joining the session. Thank you, Julie, from us all. Huge thanks also to Kite Consulting, who have kindly agreed to host on their platform and provide presentation logistics and support for the three webinar sessions. We are fortunate indeed to have Dr. Brian Waters, Senior Lecturer for Leadership and Change at MOD Shrevenham and Cranfield University. Brian returns due to popular demand as his presentation last year on the formation of the Iraqi police force was well received. We are delighted to welcome him back to address the highly topical subject, adaptive leadership. What COVID-19 has taught us about leading in changing situations when we need to adapt. The format for this session is outlined in your brochure. And for clarity, after Brian's presentation, we will be directed to breakout rooms to discuss a specific question posed by Brian. Each breakout room will be hosted by a facilitator from the WCF committee. And in addition, on the completion of the breakout session, a designated spokesperson from each group will form part of a panel discussion with Brian. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Brian Waters. Thank you very much, Christopher. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, I'm normally working in the realm of defense and wider security, but as with last year, it's a joy to come and share some of my learning and my experience with you. Um, I'm going to be talking about adaptive leadership and its role in how you might perceive it of value in your situation. And um, the discussion is based on, on three pieces of literature, which I've listed there for you. Um, Heifetz, Heifetz and colleagues and a guy called Peter Northhouse with a very good book on leadership theory and practice. I, I'm going to ask you if you would think and listen quickly because I'm going to cover quite a lot of material. Some of the material on the slides I will not speak to, but you have the slides for future reference. So in his seminal book, um, Adaptive Leadership, Ron Heifetz talks about different types of problems. He's building on some earlier work by um, Horse Riddle and Melvin Weber in 1973 about social planning, where they coined the terms tame and wicked problems. And Ron Heifetz calls these technical and adaptive problems, very similar to the idea of Riddle and Weber. And many of you may know Keith Grint took this work a little further in 2010 with his paper, Wicked Problems and Clumsy Solutions and the Role of Leadership. So I'm going to use all of that to try and make sense of, of how we lead in this sort of adaptive world we find ourselves at the moment. I'm not gonna emphasize COVID too much because I just think it's too depressing. Um, I, I will try and contextualize what I'm talking about with your context in, in agriculture. So we be begin with this first type of problem. Um, and, and I just warns us that one of the great leadership failures occurs when we try and treat adaptive problems as, as technical problems or adaptive challenges as technical problems. He uses the word adaptive challenge and adaptive problem interchangeably, so I will. So what are these technical problems? Well, these may be very complex. In your industry, you have many complex problems, 
but they're problems that have known solutions. You've just got to get to the solution by applying standard operational procedures. Those sort of applications, the, the, the authority and the knowledge for solving them lives within the organization or the organization can, can access them. Um, he then talks about this other type of problem, the, the, the adaptive problem. And this differentiates itself from the technical problem because there is no known solution. I work in national security. There is no solution to national security. So I actually work in national insecurity. Um, and we have to be comfortable with working in a realm for which there are no solutions, just like you know, crime. You, you work in, in the rural community and you have rural crime. What is the solution to rural crime? There doesn't appear to be one. So you live within this particular problem. And so you, you, you address the problem through changing your priorities, beliefs, habits and loyalties. And, and you make progress by going beyond authoritative expertise, sort of working out different ways to do it, mobilizing discovery. Shedding entrenched ways, you know, just because we've always done it doesn't mean we should always do it. So be prepared to tolerate the loss that that mindset creates. And in so doing, generate this new capacity to thrive. And we might talk about the agricultural bill a bit later. Um, so technical and adaptive problems. They don't become stamps. They don't become, this is a technical problem, this is an adaptive problem. Part of the problem is working out what sort of a problem it is. And that in itself can sometimes be an adaptive problem. They're often intertwined. And you've got to distinguish between these two different types of problems. And tackle the technical problems within your organization's resources. Then mobilize learning and wider stakeholders to address these adaptive problems or challenges. You've got to recognize that some of these challenges are insurmountable, a little like my example of security or crime, and they've got to be lived with. And in leading your organization through this adaptive problem, you're minimizing the impacts of these symptoms on your organization, the symptoms of the adaptive problem. You're often stepping into the unknown space, disturbing what Heifetz calls the equilibrium. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So you need to learn to navigate this disequilibrium. How do you do that? Well, it's about understanding and managing yourself. What, what do you know you don't know? What do you know you might need to know? Having a degree of humility. And as a leader, helping people tolerate the discomfort they're experiencing. We'll, we'll look at a diagram to explain that in a moment. Distinguish through experimentation what is essential and what is expendable. You know, don't stick with what we've always done. It's the way we do things around here, shed that sort of mindset. So your goal should be, as Heifetz describes it, to maintain this productive zone of disequilibrium. Too much heat and the organization explodes. Too little heat and it doesn't get off its backside. So you've got to find this motivational space. And he uses a diagram to explain it with disequilibrium and time on the axes and, and the blue space um, below the limit of tolerance and above the threshold of change. And he calls it this productive zone of disequilibrium. It's just an analogy for being sufficiently uncomfortable, recognizing reality to take action, but not so uncomfortable that you burn out. So the technical problem comes out of disequilibrium and we deal with it using our standard operational procedures, our, our knowledge and resources within the organization. This adaptive problem, we take into this zone of disequilibrium. We don't let it stay in the zone of comfort. We bring it into this zone of disequilibrium in order to mobilize the resources in, that we need to deal with it. And the longer we keep it in the productive zone of disequilibrium, Heifetz argues that the better comes our solutions for managing the situation created by the adaptive problem. So it's, it's all about maintaining this sense of urgency to, to, to deal with the difficult problem. Um, if you go into too much heat, then you trigger the, the fight flight mechanism that we all have. So what you're trying to do is keep people sufficiently uncomfortable to take action, not too comfortable that they stop taking action, not too uncomfortable that they run away or fight it. 
So, and he calls this adaptive leadership. And he talks about it as the, the adaption of new possibilities and challenges. He talks about thriving. He talks about thriving. And, and he sums it up by adaptive leadership is the practice of mobilizing people to tackle tough challenges and thrive. Because there's no point in tough and uh, tackling tough challenges and wilting. So what does he mean by thriving? He, his background is, is, is a, a doctor, medical doctor, and he uses evolutionary biology um, to explain what he means by thriving. And so he talks about the concept of DNA. So he said, you've got to preserve the DNA of the organization to continue its survival. You've got to be prepared to disregard or rearrange the DNA that no longer serves the organization's current needs. And you've got to create DNA arrangements that enable the organization to flourish in new ways in this more challenging environment. So it's about successful adaption. Adaptive leadership and enabling this capacity to thrive. So new environments. You've got to think of new strategies. The old strategies don't work. You've got to embrace ideas like adaptive strategy. Um, emergent strategy. Leadership must wrestle with normative questions of value, purpose and process. This is one of the ways by focusing on ideas like value, purpose and process helps you as the leader get through this volatile, uncertain environment. So define thriving. Well, you define it for yourself, really. Um, and we'll be asking one of the syndicates to do it at the end. Maybe it's about increasing short and long term shareholder value. Maybe it's about creating exceptional customer service. Maybe it's about high morale in, in the workforce and also creating a, a positive social and environmental impact. Maybe that's what we consider thriving. And this idea of the DNA analogy, um, Heifetz reminds us of, about the, the, the human genome. And he talks about the differentiation between the chimpanzee genome and the human genome. So over evolution, what is the difference? It's actually 1.2% only. So call it 2% in round figures. So the, the, between humans, our, our genetic difference is minuscule, but between the chimpanzee and ourselves, it's only 1.2%. So 98% is common. So to go from a chimpanzee to a human being only needed a change of 2% of the DNA. And so when one's thinking about changing organizations, you don't need to think too radically if we take this analogy. So, so you know, what is essential therefore to preserve your organization's heritage? What's expendable? So successful adaptions are, are conservative and progressive. It's a balance of both, we'll talk about that. And this effective change is, it has to be anchored in our values, especially our competencies and how we orientate ourselves in the strategic environment. So he talks about experimentation. What, what you're looking at is because you don't have a solution, you've got to experiment. Um, you've got to have an experimental mindset. You've got to learn to improvise within realistic parameters, you've got to have the resources with which to improvise, to develop a set of experiments. And it's, it's about building this sort of diverse culture. Um, th there are no geniuses who are gonna tell you how to solve it because it can't be solved. So in order to manage this disequilibrium, you've got to capture the wisdom of, of what Heifetz calls micro environments. But you know, who are these people with ideas across the organization, creating an environment where people feel free without fear of criticism to come up with ideas? Um, but we don't like this unknown. We don't like stepping out of our comfort zone. Um, and, and this takes us to ideas like systems one and systems two thinking. Uh, Daniel Kahneman's excellent book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. Um, we react emotionally, he calls it system one, with, with what is sometimes called the subconscious mind, this vast reservoir of every experience we've ever had. And it comes 
to the fore. And it's part of our survival technique. We are hardwired to behave like this. Um, and, and we have a whole series of, of sort of cognitive biases like social proofing, negative biasing, status quo biasing that cause us to, to shy away from, from the unknown, to, to shy away from, from things that we haven't done before. And because we think emotionally before we think rationally, we've got to learn to use our rational thinking to calm us down. And that presents a slight problem because in our systems to thinking, in our conscious mind, we can only hold between five and nine conscious thoughts. Whereas we have millions of subconscious thoughts interfering with our actions and often bypassing our conscious mind. So it's worth understanding that if you don't understand it, read Kahneman's book. So I said, so progress is radical yet incremental. So compared to biological evolution, our adaptions are lightning fast. However, we still need time to consolidate these new norms we're creating or these new processes. It requires persistence. Adaptive leaders need to know how to stay in the game and how to take the heat. How do you manage the volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world? How do you manage yourself in it? That's really important. So it's, it's not about how strong you are. It, it's about how adaptable you are, how willing you are to adapt. And Darwin summed that up beautifully. I said I'd mention a, a sort of a way to think about it. This is John Fisher's transition curve, sort of adaptive change on the left and moving forward. And they sometimes call it the J curve. And you, you hit the bottom of the J curve, the guilt, depression sort of area. And in change, we all go through this at different speeds, at different tempos. So you as the leader go through it and you're probably into gradual acceptance moving forward while many of your people are still going down through fear, threat and guilt. And so understanding where people sit in terms of how they perceive the current situation and dealing with people in denial and dealing with people who are hostile is very important. And so, we, we sort of think about observe, interpret and intervene. The, the, this simple model that, that HIFIS uses in terms of how you orientate yourself to this adaptive leadership. And remember, this is iterative. So the first thing you've got to do is understand what's going on, understand the context. And he uses a lovely phrase, sort of get off the dance floor onto the balcony. What he's talking about there is being able to see the bigger picture. Because if you're right down on the dance floor, if you're down on the shop floor, you can't see the bigger picture. You can't see the periphery, you know, who's talking to who among the stakeholder community, who's responding to who. You know, what are the alliances and relationships that are going on beyond the straightforward organizational chart? You know, understanding the history of the problem. You know, what are the sort of different views of the problem? So what are the patterns, the wider patterns of behavior that, that may impact on the problem? And this requires sort of multiple interpretations. There are no single truths because there are only a series of hypotheses because there is no solution to the adaptive problem. You're managing the state of disequilibrium. And, and our, our brain, as I mentioned before, is, is hardwired. It's a fundamental primitive survival technique. We form patterns. We form patterns that we then try and make sense of them with the systems two thinking, having developed them with our system one thinking. So we, we, we avoid action before we've tested our interpretation. We don't leap in with our hunch. You know, we, we don't leap in with our system one thinking. We bring this system two analysis to bear. We also avoid the seduction of tackling the technical problems, delegate those. You know, there's a terrible seduction to tackle problems that we have solutions for and avoid the problems we don't have solutions for. So we need to hold these multiple interpretations simultaneously. You know, avoid seeking the one right answer because there isn't one. Hold as many plates spinning as you can. An interpretation is only a guess of what's going on. A hypothesis is a guess until it's tested. He, he advises, I think it's a really good idea and I've done it myself, to, to make your thinking public, maybe within a trusted inner group initially, 
to, to test the experiment, get people's reaction to it. I and mean, is it totally barking mad or is there some sense to it? And then intervene. But intervene using your hypothesis. Form experiments. If people can't see the relevance of your idea, then they're going to write it off as, as your hobby horse. Again, you know, taking Cotter's eight step model, you know, you need to build this group of people around you who are empathetic to the idea and willing to give it a go. So practice designing interventions outside your comfort zone, but consider your own skills and competencies. We mentioned this before. You know, do you have the skills and competencies to enact your hypothesis, even to develop your hypothesis? John F. Kennedy, wonderful quote, leadership and learning are indispensable from each other. So what do you need to know? What, what additional learning do you require? What courses do you need to attend? Ideas like your, your management programs to develop and teach new areas of knowledge and new skills to better make sense of context and develop strategies. And then experimenting. So there is no obvious answer, so it's an experiment. And the thing about experiments is they often fail and go wrong. So you've got to be prepared for that. Um, if, we, if we look at the, the, the COVID thing with, with the government and COBRA, I mean, failure after failure after failure, giving the opposition parties huge fun at the expense of government. Maybe the government never made it quite clear that they're experimenting. They kept calling it a plan. It wasn't a plan, it was planning. We'll mention that at the end. So you need to run each experiment with hopeful conviction. I, I use the analogy of marriage, an adaptive challenge. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, the, the test of first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. So don't get fixated with a single solution. Keep a number of things in the air. And remember that, that you need to connect through your values in, and, and your beliefs. Um, you've got to engage hearts and minds to overcome the status quo bias. Hearts, because remember, 95% of our initial thinking is emotional, not logical. So connect to purpose. So what is the purpose of this? What are we trying to do? So what, what does this purpose look like? You know, will, 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 will your results be valued by the organization? Are you on the right track? Can you cope with tough questions? Um, yeah, and the answers often lie in the articulation of your own personal values and the values of the organization. So when facing a tough decision, um, when prospects for success can look very bleak, explaining to a trusted other is a way of maintaining your sense of purpose and your, your own personal morale. Every time I've led in difficult circumstances, I've had this trusted other, someone I can talk to who understands the context. There was never any point in sort of talking to my wife on the phone, much as she is my trusted other in many aspects, but she didn't understand the context. So someone who understands the context. And then the wisdom of Socrates, remember the more you begin to understand something, the more you begin to understand how little you actually understand. I, I mentioned this, sort of acronym VUCA developed by the US Army War College to understand the situations in this global war on terror, as the Americans call it, this volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world. Dealing with, as Donald Rumsfeld called them, the, the, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. So you deal with known unknowns as a leader, but there are unknown unknowns that come and bite you and you've got to be prepared for them. Um, I, I give you something there from George Eustace talking about a policy change within British agriculture, which I'm sure you all know now by heart, sort of moving away from the basic payment scheme into incentivizing sustainable farming practice, creating habitats for nature recovery and supporting the establishment of new woodland and ecosystem services to help tackle challenges like climate change, another adaptive problem. Um, and, and talking about helping people leave, the, can't cope with the change and bringing new people in. Um, in, in a military context, th th this idea is, is quite common to us. Military history has taught us that to have a plan and stick with the plan 
like The Charge of the Light Brigade, or if you've never seen the film A Bridge Too Far, I commend it to you. It's about reinforcing a plan that was not adapted to the changing situation and the plan failed. So, and this was taught to us by a, a Prussian, von Moltke, who lost the first Franco-Prussian War. So the Prussians lost to the French, which was very upsetting for the Prussians. Um, and he argued that no plan of operation extends beyond any certainty, beyond the first contact with the main hostile force. Dwight D. Eisenhower, echoing that later, said, plans are nothing, planning is everything. This is from his time as a general during World War II. So plans are not important. It's the planning that's important because situations will overtake the plan. That's what we've done, I hope. And I hope you're able to think and listen quickly. I've just presented you a series of ideas, a series of concepts, a series of perspectives a series of perspectives. Remember Einstein's great wisdom, you know, the problems that we've created have been created by a certain way of thinking. If we continue thinking the same way, we're never gonna solve the problems. We've gotta think differently. I leave you with one final uh, piece of wisdom from a quite controversial American general, rather sexist the way he explains it, but of course he didn't command any ladies in World War II. So I don't measure a man's success by how high he climbs, but how high he bounces when he hits bottom. This idea of resilience, which is absolutely essential in adaptive leadership, because your experiments are going to fail. How will you deal with that? That brings me to the end. I think I'm on time. Um, you've had this before. I'd ask Syndicate 1 and 2 if they would think about some technical problems facing farming in the next 20 years. Syndicates 3 and 4 to think about some adaptive problems or challenges facing farming in the next 20 years. And then Syndicates 5 and 6, could you look at what thriving means um, for the future of agriculture? You know, what would you identify as the DNA of farming that's essential for the industry's survival? You know, what's the DNA of farming that might no longer serve the industry in the future? And then how would you rearrange that DNA to enable farming to flourish in this challenging future environment? So three different questions. If I could ask the facilitators, please, to summarize their syndicates thinking in three minutes on our return. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I was co-opted into one group, which was wonderful, um, hence my muted microphone. I asked if you could just report in plenary a, a, a synopsis of, of the discussion. Um, sort of group one and two had the same discussion, three, four the same, five, six the same. So could we start with group one and group two, just give a synopsis of what they talked about in terms of technical problems. So I'll start as group one then. So Thank we've given the question, what are the technical problems facing farming in the next 20 years? And the key technical problems we came up with were around soil health, organic matter, um, the use of imported proteins for feed, um, labour, um, use of crop protection products and the use going forward and wider aspects of the technical problems associated with climate change. Well, we said in the discussion, we talked around a number of factors, one of which was that actually we were trying to define technical problems when there was a need for adaptive change and you couldn't separate the technical problem from the adaptive change. And we were saying that without adapt, adaptive leadership becomes difficult if there isn't a, a, a sense of urgency created and that sense of urgency could be created either within the business itself or more widely because of changes to payments to farmers or indeed um, a commercial driver. One of the challenges we felt in conclusion was that those um, commercial drivers aren't there at the moment. So we're seeing individual businesses and individuals addressing some of the technical problems, but not the industry. And hopefully that sums up what we said. Super, thank you very much indeed. That's great, Louise. Uh, number two, please. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can take over from Mark. I have technical problems of my own getting into my 
breakout room. But I, I mean, I think uh, um, Louise has covered most of it. Uh, the other thing we uh, felt in terms of this crossover between adaptive problems and technical problems was that um, there was a certain amount of legislation which um, produced its own technical problems. Uh, we didn't really know where um, consumer behavior fitted into the, those were technical problems or whether they were adaptive problems, but we felt there was a certain amount of overlap between the two. And the other thing that was brought up, um, I think we've mentioned sort of welfare standards, genetics and uh, um, genomics, but um, the other thing that was brought up uh, by Thomas was the idea of the challenges of research and the ability to actually delve down into the technical problems to, to see what the known solutions are, because certainly um, when it comes to soil health, I think that uh, there are more unknown knowns than known knowns. <laughs> Super. Thank you very much. Could we go to group three, please? Yes, uh, Brian. So we had, uh, what are the adaptive challenges or stroke problems facing farming in the next 20 years? Um, we only got as far as discussing two, really, but um, Brexit was the first one which was thrown up. And it, although it was decided it was a technical problem, the adaptive solution is going to be individual to businesses, to sectors, to management responses as to how businesses change and thrive in the, beyond the technical challenge of Brexit, uh, whatever that may look like. Um, I think the, the solution um, with, from one person was throw your business off the cliff and see how well it bounces, which I think was basically saying, how resilient <laughs> is your business today? Uh, what happens if you remove the BPS? Uh, and you know, how will your business stand on its own two feet, which I think was, was you know, pretty sensible. But it's also going to require a lot of planning and preparation to enable businesses to thrive. Um, and it's diff definitely adaptive because different businesses are going to respond differently. Then there was an option about um, trying to reduce costs um, in response to that challenge with machinery sharing, working with other businesses uh, and seeing how that could develop. The second challenge was climate change. Um, and there were a lot of questions around climate change, maybe not many solutions. And everyone agreed it's definitely going to be adaptive over the coming decade or beyond. But who, how and where do we get paid for carbon? How measurable is carbon sequestration? Um, it's going to definitely be adaptive because it's going to be gradual learning, new knowledge, carbon calculators will be adapted, improved, and um, at the moment they give uh, a generalisation as to the direction of travel and the footprint, but maybe they're not as accurate as they could be. Question marks about where, the, the, if, if a product contains carbon, such as a tonne of wheat, where does, that, um, where does that carbon footprint actually lie? Because at the moment the arable farmer is not rewarded for storing the carbon in, in that product even though it's not the arable farmer who then releases the product. It could either be society in flour or it could be animals further down the supply chain. Um, carbon footprinting, its accuracy and how it's, uh, and its relationship with future trade agreements is another critical area to uh, make sure that uh, producers in this country with net zero ambitions aren't undermined. Um, do we have to accept that feeding the population will always have a carbon footprint? And that getting to uh, net zero um, via um, offsetting, actually all it hides is inefficiency. So what we need to look at is being best in class to make sure that our carbon footprints in the UK are the lowest in the world. Um, and what does net zero actually look like for the industry? So there was a lot of questions and not necessarily a lot of solutions. Thank you very much indeed. That's super. As we said at the beginning, Tom, in 20 minutes, we're not going to solve the problem. Um, could I have the next group, please? Group four. Yes, hi, hi, Richard. Yeah, I was looking at, we were here, room four, looking at adaptive challenges as well. And almost we looked on, on different planes that's possible, Brian, in terms of uh, uh, how far up the balcony you, you, you were looking down. Um, and some debate about whether things like uh, the sources, what energy sources we'll be using in farming over the next 20 years indeed, or generating a profit from, from BPS, and whether that was a technical or an adaptive challenge as we went through, um, what will agriculture look like and uh, who will be in agriculture? And then we almost moved on to another plane, it seemed to me, in terms of saying, 
okay, um, what do we use land for? And land ownership, and perhaps uh, we get hung up in, in terms of seeing ourselves as farmers um, rather than uh, business owners. And so at different eras there, you won't be surprised to, to, to know that we also talked about climate change and those, those areas there. So, um, as I say, different, uh, different levels from, from technical challenge to, as I say, the overview of um, the whole adaptive challenge of how do we uh, look at what we're doing? Why are we farming? What is land for? Those are uh, some, some, uh, some big, big questions, I think. Thanks, Brian. Super, Richard. Thank you very much indeed. If you could move to group five, please. Um, okay. Yes, so we looked at um, three, three elements of this. First, what stands us in good stead in our DNA of farming to thrive. And we, we really need a three-sided coin for this session. But uh, first, uh, tradition. Um, that, that's a good point. Uh, engagement with like-minded people. Um, we're producers, we're doers, we do things. Uh, diversity, there are different points of view within the, within the whole farming community. Adaptability, very much can-do attitude. Listening to the customer, we weren't too sure about, there were some different views on that. Um, succession, meaning longevity, okay, we're here to stay, not just for the short term, and resilience. People felt that resilience stood us in good stead. What, second part of the question was, what may hold us back from thriving in the future in terms of our DNA? You won't be surprised to hear the same things. Uh, so, um, tradition, uh, it's good, but it may also hold us back. We've always done it that way, uh, etc. cetera. Um, a fear of being transparent and the media, in other words, that insulation. So good is engagement with like-minded people, negative fear of um, uh, engagement with the outside world. Uh, sense of entitlement was picked up. And then PR was mentioned a few times. Uh, our PR is poor and our engagement with the community. We engage with each other, but not, not necessarily with the community. And then the final point that was picked up was actually as a, as a threat uh, and was just mentioned by the last speaker was uh, attachment to land uh, and that sort of lack of flexibility about being able to divorce ownership and occupation from the business side of, of farming. Third element was what rearranging of DNA, what arranging of DNA does there have to be to actually help us thrive in the future then? So uh, here we go, fast and furious list, connectivity to science and to others generally um, and to other ideas. So realizing that we're not unique and connecting to other sectors, learning from other sectors uh, and industries, stealing the best ideas. Humil tied in with that humility, um, recognition that we need to work with others, that we're, you know, that, that we're not uh, unique, but at the same time, not undervaluing ourselves. Um, resilience needs to be developed. We are resilient, but some sectors are less resilient. They need to be developed to be able to cope with volatility that's going to face us. Business acumen, actually a good example, the falling off a cliff point, if we diversify, uh, you realise you, you you have to be a business so you don't succeed. Somehow we felt uh, um, we, we felt in some way buffered in farming, uh, and that somehow we can go carry on even if, in strict business terms, it's not working. Partly because of subsidy, uh, partly because of sales of land. Um, main key other main key points is agility. We need to be agile and uh, fleet of foot and anticipate the views of society. Have an open ear and be ready to uh, take them on and also not be afraid to ask for help. The final point was we need boots on the ground in the corridors of power. Some might say they're already there influencing government because they've got to get what the issues are that have just been talked about by other speakers. They've got to understand them and how farming can be the solution. Thank you. Oh, that tested my note taking. Thank you very much indeed. Julie, that's wonderful. Uh, and then could we have number six, please? Yes, hi, Richard Malega Mambi. Um, basically carrying on from Julie, um, the first question is identify the DNA in farming. Uh, it, it varies between what I call 
people who are more on the commercial side, e.g. producing non non producing subsidized products. Uh, so they were basically profit, profit, profit. Uh, there's long term passion of the industry, thinking, resilience. Uh, the new generations are prepared to take uh, take risks and be more entrepreneurial. Sometimes they're thrown in the deep end and they've just got to get on and do it. And they, they're the ones that tend to take outside advice, but that is just a pure uh, observation. Uh, there is a desire to produce, and that's really created from the post-war strategy of farming. It hasn't necessarily changed hugely, except subsidies have moved a little bit in that. Uh, and innovation, managing risk of the unknown, such as politics, weather, etc., also part of the DNA of uh, farming, uh, and the ability to work uh, some pretty antisocial hours to, to get the job done is an amazing asset we have. Uh, what is the DNA of, of farming? The second question is, what is the DNA of farming that might no longer serve the industry in the future? Uh, debated quite hard. Um, I sort of took notes on the fact that the older generation, uh, we think, or the view was, is, is stifling the next generation or not allowing um, uh, the younger generation to, in to take risks and get control of the capital. Uh, that will then lead on to the second point I wrote down was a lack of long term thinking then in the financial acumen. A lot of people stay in the business and hope the, the next generation will just carry on paying. So therefore, there's, there's the risk in the business of uh, one generation wants to protect the capital and the other one wants to spend it and, and risk it. Uh, so that was fear of losing more capital. Capital expenditure is very much in farming currently geared to machinery. 40% of most farmers' biggest decision is, is uh, buying machinery. Uh, and I just added a lack of capital in research and PR. Um, the third point, given an example of DNA arrangement that would enable farming to flourish in the challenge of the environment, we actually, to be fair, didn't spend a huge amount of time on this, but two points came out very strongly was joint ventures uh, with your neighbours and also cooperation, the two big things that we, we felt we could, uh, it, it could then help build up uh, farming businesses and cut costs and also develop new research and ideas. So there, there are our points. Thank you very much from Group 6. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I would never attempt to try and summarize all that. Um, what I took away from it was, first of all, the diversity of thinking, what in the, the social sciences they call cognitive diversity. So th there was a huge diversity of thinking against those three quite provocative questions. Um, in 20 minutes of brainstorming, uh, and we have captured this because it's being filmed, uh, I think there were some staggering ideas, um, some of which will be very well known to many, maybe hopefully some of them won't be well known to many. It, it highlighted a point I made at the beginning of my talk that one of the great challenges, an adaptive challenge, is trying to understand what sort of a problem you're dealing with. And I think that the carbon business really brought that into line, as well as, you know, the, the, the whole concept of um, the idea of capital in farming. Now, I've always you know, talk to some of my farming friends and say, you know, you're a multimillionaire with no disposable income. I mean, how does that make sense? You know, um, and, and it's it, it, those, those sort of ideas. But I think the, the, the major thing I took away was, was how this very simple formula of adaptive and technical problems can, can be used to make sense uh, of the challenges facing the farming in the agricultural industry. And, um, and maybe there's something you might like to take forward there, using simple frameworks for sense making. I said that's one of the human traits, using simple frameworks for sense making. So I take away from that 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 simple framework enabled enormous sense making in such a very short period of time. So can I just thank everybody for engaging in, 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 the, um, in the questions and, and finding some value in, in this rather simple but provocative formula. And I go back that these problems don't come labelled adaptive and technical. It's you who decide what sort of a problem they are by understanding the problem. And, and the more you understand the problem, the more you can see the big problem, the adaptive problem, and also sort of slaughter the small technical problems wrapped up in it, entangled in it. Um, and, and, but, but not be seduced into the technical problems. 
so as, as leaders in the industry, maintaining your focus on the adaptive problem. And I think you summarize them superbly. I have nothing else to add. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Brian Waters for his thought provoking presentation. Secondly, you, the audience, for all your contributions in the breakout rooms. I would especially like to thank all the panelists for bringing the thoughts of the audience to the panel session. We were joined by Professor Louise Manning of RAU, representing the management course, Richard Soff, representing the challenge of rural leadership, Julie Robinson from Roy Thorns, our session sponsor, Gavin Lane, the chairman of Livia Education Committee, Tom Bradshaw, Vice President of the National Farmers Union and past course member, and also Richard Milligan-Mamby, a past member of the MBA programme and committee member. I would like to take this opportunity in thanking my fellow committee members for acting as facilitators today and all the time they've put in to the committee work leading up to today's event. And finally, to Duncan Cooper, the secretary to the Alumni Association who has put in a huge amount of work in organising today's event. Thank you, Duncan. The next webinar in this series will be on the 14th of January, 2021, and is entitled, Turning Crisis into an Opportunity. We look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you so much. Thank you, and happy Christmas, everybody. Thank you, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Many thanks. Bye-bye. Thank Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.